All right, we should be should be going. It's definitely going. Yeah, we're going. <laughs> you always have to be sure. You always have to double check. Uh, in these uncertain times, you must always make sure that you are truly going live. Good evening and welcome to the September edition of the Writers Guild Spoken Word Series. My name is Tony Brewer and along with Joan Hawkins, I am the co-producer of the series we've been uh, this is our fourth year doing the series and we've hosted it in a couple of uh, live venues around Bloomington and now we're doing it virtually uh, which has opened up some possibilities for us as we continue to shelter in place stay together apart wear our mask, wash our hands, that sort of thing. But we're glad that you could join us. We are sponsored in part by the Indiana Arts Commission, the Bloomington Arts Commission, and the Bloomington Urban Enterprise Association. I also wanted to mention that the Writers Guild of Bloomington wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University and the city of Bloomington were built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Um, I had a couple of notes, uh, things going on with the guild that I wanted to mention. <clears throat> um, let's see, Third Sunday Light is our uh, virtual Facebook workshop. Uh, we continue to hold the Third Sunday Right virtually with monthly prompts. Uh, we gather in a private Facebook group and the prompts are sent to you by the third Friday of the month so that you can share a piece by the third Sunday um, on that, uh, in that Facebook group. If you are interested in joining the third Sunday right virtual edition, contact Shauna Ritter at Shauna Ritter at Shauna, S-H-A-N-A, Shauna747 at gmail.com. Uh, all this information is also available on our website, which is writersguildbloomington.com, or you can find us on any of those fantastic social media platforms that we all know and love. We're, we're pretty active on all of them. So speaking of active, um, coming up in a couple of weeks is our monthly business meeting on Saturday, September 19th, 3 p.m. Uh, via Zoom. You can contact the Guild uh, for the link through our website, like I said, um, through our website or on uh, social media. And this is a business meeting. We don't talk too much about writing. We mostly talk about the nuts and bolts of running a literary not-for-profit. Uh, but if you are interested in the behind the scenes and the folks that um, keep our little guild together and uh, keep things active, uh, definitely come check it out. I also encourage you to, if you haven't already, you should uh, like, the Writers Guild Facebook page. Uh, for one thing, um, that is the surest way to when we do go live with something like this, you will get an automatic notification that we've gone live and you don't have to search around frantically trying to find the video. Facebook likes to hide such things. I'm not sure why. Um, also, um, if you go to our website, there are opportunities for you to donate to this deserving 501c3 not-for-profit corporation if you do, if you so desire. You can also just give us your email address and we send a news, we will send a newsletter to you. Uh, Joan Hawkins has been doing a fantastic job since the lockdown of curating and editing and putting together a, just a wonderful newsletter. Um, of course, we're not doing very much because because um, we can't do um, this. This is our kind of our one event other than the, the workshop. And so all of our other events have sort of been folded into this one. But Jonah's been keeping tabs on um, 
grant opportunities happening around the state, as well as uh, other literary happenings that other uh, groups and events are doing, and publishing poems by uh, Writers Guild members. So it's it's a good newsletter. Um, it's more than just what we do. Um, it's a little bit of everything happening around the state. So get yourself informed and sign up for it. Uh, lastly, I wanted to mention uh, the Fourth Street Festival, of course, is not happening this year in person. It's virtual this year, and they're, um, they'll have a website, um, sort of a virtual store that's going to go live this weekend, Labor Day weekend, as usual. Uh, the Writers Guild normally does a two-day spoken word stage. Of course, we'll not will not be doing that this year. What we have instead is curated some performances by Writers Guild um, members, um, some of our crew and staff and officers and people who um, organize all of our events. <clears throat> this court put together a little showcase of um, some of the movers and shakers behind the scenes. So, and that's going to go live this weekend. Definitely check out the uh, Fourth Street Festival um, uh, website, which I believe is Fourth Street Number Four TH Street dot org, and that's those uh, that will be up through the end of the year as well. So I'm uh, super excited about our um, features this evening. Um, Hiromi, Hiromi Yoshida is a wonderful Bloomington poet. She's uh, back. You may have heard her last month. She um, read a couple of poems commemorating uh, the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. Um, she also has a new book coming out. I think it's should be out soon. Should be out this later this month, I think. Karen George, Karen George, uh, joining us from Kentucky. And uh, Brooke Nicole Plummer joining us from up there in South Bend. Also, um, music tonight provided by Julian Douglas, fantastic percussionist, uh, also from here in Bloomington. I think, Joan, unless there's something I've forgotten, if there's something I left out, I think I covered everything. Sounds good. I can see your lips moving, but Kyle has you muted, which is fine. I think I think I got everything. So you got, you got everything. Uh, let's have a, a Zoom link to somebody. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the way this will work is um, once I'm done talking here, we're uh, we're going to have a little bit of music from Julian, and then um, each of our poets are going to do a, kind of a short set, maybe around. Um, basically, we're going to do kind of a round robin, three short sets. And then we'll have another uh, longer set uh, of music from Julian. Then we'll go back to another round robin set from each of our poets. They will immediately follow up with, uh, we'll do sort of a lightning round, one poem each uh, from our three poets. And then Julian will close us out with a short set. So without further ado, let's first hear from Julian Douglas. Julian Douglas is a percussionist, composer of contemporary world music, and a founding member of the World Percussion Ensemble Rhythm Quest. Julian's influences include musical traditions from Europe, the African diaspora, Asia, and the Middle East, but his focus has been on the creation of new music that seeks to honor the brilliance and beauty of the world's traditions while pursuing opportunities for created creativity and innovation. Let's hear from Julian Douglas.
Fantastic. Thank you, Julian. Fantastic. We'll hear some more from Julian Douglas uh, a little later on. Right now, let's turn to Hiromi, uh, first poet for this evening. Hiromi Yoshida, one of Bloomington's finest and most outspoken poets, was a semifinalist for the 2018 Wilder Series Poetry Book Prize. Her poems have been published in the Indianapolis Review, the Asian American Literary Review, Tipton Poetry Journal, Evergreen Review, and the Rain, Party, and Disaster Society. She is the author of Joyce and Young, The Four Stages of Eroticism in A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and the chapbook just out from Finishing Line Press, Icarus Burning, Hiromi Yoshida. Thank you, Tony, for that beautiful introduction. And more thanks to the Writers Guild at Bloomington for inviting me to read this month. All right, that was a really mesmerizing performance by Julian, and I feel like those rhythms kind of carry on into this poem that, that I'm about to read, and that is the title poem of my forthcoming chapbook, Icarus Burning. The Aztec heart of the sun blazes. A rush hour trail of amniotic blood. Across skyscraping, Altars of plexiglass horizons, shimmering in the golden crucible of the salt licked red sea tides. Of questions pickled in formaldehyde jars and X rated carbon copies, of bones leaching on periphery. Loose lines. Twisting a ticker tape dance through the magnetic flush of anemone fingers reaching into oversized manila envelopes. Sanctified Valentine, in utero extremist. The CD pulp of sun flowering high noon in boxed lunch offices with red flowering sushi and lacquer bear. Sticking the polluted pollen of this heart, ethelial kimono silk, dilated two dimensions of premature prognosis, broken beat of time, measured in silver teaspoons nauseating either. In the siren song of drowning mermaids, embroidering the counterfeit gold rush fringe of stock exchanges, coin-sized overreach toward the numb vanishing point of decimated dollars and decapitated cents. Nicarus minted in accolades of green, plunging into the copper plate sea of acidic tears, waxing toward the boiling point on the Hudson horizon of disheveled trees in Riverside Park, of sinking suns and new moons, giving new birth to the fallen stars in the debris of night. The harlot's jewel case flung open at the neon feet of commuters surging through the turnstiles. Green subway lines, tarnished tokens. Royal and mass, Nikes, rollerblades, avian moons, winging home on spiked gatorade. Deli light splintering through the fluorescent eyes of the nymphomaniac caravan, needling 
through the needy night. Murmurous with a junky scrawl of graffiti incantations, rumbling through the groins of iconoclastic acolytes. Green, gangrenous envy in burning vile. The new apocalypse squeezing through the tinfoiled undergarments of transvestites chewing on tinsel gum wrappers and gunshot wounds, leading a stigmata of spare change and jangling eyes, begging the bony hand to cast a jaundiced benediction of swiney ropes, twining rosary beads of perspiration through the tangled traffic of funereal arteries, oozing green blood and light through the eustachian tunnels and the bloodshot eye vessels blinking on jewel-strung highways and AM radio static, crackling through the dark of fly night at ground zero below sea level. Okay, so that was Icarus Burning. I'm now going to read an unpublished poem titled Godwind, and it's a kind of a sequel to Icarus Burning in the sense that it also deals with 9-11, but in a way that's even more direct, and perhaps more contemporary, Godwind. The planes deliberately collided into the World Trade Center, North and South Towers, like steel-winged Icarus, twinned, burning. Kamikaze crash and decimation the shredded paper gods shedding green pennies and white hair. The Manhattan skyline was a smoggy plexiglass altar where dreams were sacrificed to the rising sun, that smirking bastard. Pedestrians coughed, gagged, on the foretaste of phoenix ash, lax stench, needless apocalypse, clogged nostrils, resurrection, an unwritten blueprint, drifting on wayward godwind, till roses in brownstone bay window boxes bloomed into bruised mouths, blowing coronavirus kisses. And for this round, I'll read just one more poem, and this is called Last Supper in Terre Haute. And this, and this has been included recently in the Inverse Poetry Archive. Last Supper in Terre Haute. The sky was a leaden slab, oppressing the horizontal land beneath it. Nimbus clouds, the color of jail suit orange, collided and coalesced like dirty cotton candy, rolling into the unkempt backyards of Bloomington, Indiana. The morning, Timothy McVeigh was scheduled to die in Terre Haute. Iconically speaking, he was a lethal injection in the Promethean heartland of America, wielding a poisonous pen that resurrected Invictus in the cold refrigerator dawn eliciting an extreme aversion for 
chocolate mint ice cream. The last supper, indulge out. On the long spoon of public concession, spanning the distance between himself and the collateral damage at the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. After the execution, he morphed into a dirty, animus, incubus, coalescing viscously like toxic orange storm clouds. The diarrheic Indiana skies vomiting pints of chocolate mint ice cream, laced with sodium pentothal, pancuronium bromide, and potassium chloride circulating intravenously throughout the sepia-colored landscapes of the United States of America. Thanks, Hiromi. That was great. We'll have uh, Hiromi back here in a little bit. Next, I want to welcome Karen George. Karen George is author of five chapbooks and two poetry collections from Dos Madres Press, Swim Your Way Back from 2014 and A Map in One Year from 2018. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her work has appeared in Adirondack Review, Valparaiso Poetry Review, South Dakota Review, Naugatuck River Review, and Tipton Poetry Journal. She reviews poetry at Poetry Matters. Uh, I'll put that link uh, in the chat and on Facebook. And she is the co-founder and fiction editor of the online, online journal Waypoints. And again, I'll put that link uh, where you can see it as well. Please welcome Karen George. Hello, everyone. I want to thank Tony and the Bloomington Writers Guild for inviting me to read. I'm going to start with some poems from my first full length collection, Swim Your Way Back. And it's about my husband and a cruise that we took to Alaska a few months before he died. <clears throat> Excuse me. Grace. A friend sent her essay about a great blue heron that flew across her car's hood so close she could have touched it without the windshield in the way. She lived near a river where they nested in treetops. Her family mired in crises, the bird in flight yanked her back. I thanked her, said her story salvaged me. You near the end, not eating, barely sipping, each day more skeletal. She vowed to send a heron our way. Two dawns later on our lake bank, spindly legs, neck and elongated S-curve, bill like twin blades. I slowed, lowered my window, memorized the scruffy plume feathers, the black striped from eye to crown, and when it turned its pale face to tell you every detail, how my breath ebbed when I met its onyx gaze, how I became bodiless, but for eyes, nose, and ears, the lake water sweet and feral, the snap as the wings unlatched. The last day of our Alaskan cruise, we entered Glacier Bay as the sun was rising. And this poem's title refers to calving, which is a term that describes the sudden breaking off of huge hunks of a glacier that fall into the sea with a sound like thunder. Calving at Glacier Bay. We wake before dawn, rise to the promenade deck while the onboard naturalists broadcast seeds of glacial wisdom. As our ship cues to enter the inner sanctum, thousands maneuver for spots at the rail. Ice flows bob, unveiled by tendrils of first light, 
Many hold hands while we glide through the bay's mouth. So much silence. Even he no longer explains how slabs of ice cleave and seconds later, thunder crack and impact arrive. Cloistered by cliffs of blue ice, our lungs bathed in elemental air, we spoon to view the sacred text. And I believe every wrong unwound, all ebbed back to innocence, your cancer cured. Where your eyes swim. I ask you to close your almond eyes. They roam the bedroom, rest on the telescope, hoop drum, bookshelf. Earlier, I'd read you Rumi, Neruda, Lee Young Lee. On the dresser next to the open photo album of long gone family lies the birds of Kentucky. A toothpick holds the place of the finch you'd seen ours earlier on the hill behind our patio. The bird that I could not tell you was a coiled leaf. Each day your eyes gaze farther backward instead of forward. Each time they fall on me, I hold my breath until you recognize me. I lean toward your face, hairless as a newborn's smoothing the pads of my thumbs across the ridge where your eyebrows had been, I hum amazing grace. Beneath your lids, the pupils swim like minnows below the skin of a lake. The next poems I'll read are from my latest collection, A Map in One Year, it was published in 2018. And all these are found poems created from different source documents, poems of some of my favorite poets, such as Blake, Keats, Neruda, Emily Dickinson, Jane Hirschfeld, and Adrian Rich. I also use pages from novels by James Joyce, from Vincent van Gogh's letters and uh, Frida Kahlo's diary. Excuse me, I got a little frog going here. <laughs> <clears throat> Contained, own the quiet, feel your way to the edges of sleep, like walking toward light on the horizon, folding yourself toward the heart center, the place everything begins. The shape of want, tell me about the loves and I'll translate remembered sadness and spite into a map of countable punctures you can read like lowing animals kept in inky stillness. These poems are pretty short in this volume. Listen, follow me into the dim evening orchard, your hands cool. Hear seeds journey into plants, damp prayers, hold our stories, round rough edges of words, weep the deep wounds full of light. I was lucky enough to get to travel to Paris a few years ago and my hotel room was on the eighth floor I had the loveliest view of all the rooftops of Paris. Memory, full like a lava flow, that last evening in Paris, slipping into sleep, window open, a thousand rooftops, stacked chimneys, the city's golden arteries settling into shadow. Dream brood. A man and a woman cross a field, roost beneath knitted trees, squinting into fuchsia sun, 
They swim on the sound of falling water. His hand on her thigh pulls like a bell, unfolds a moment, a window into fine silence, bone blue. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Wonderful. Let us now <clears throat> uh, have our third poet uh, in this uh, sort of round robin round that we're doing. And then we'll hear uh, a little bit more from Julian Douglas. Brooke Nicole Plummer is a writer and musician from the Midwest region. Her first full length collection of poems, Flyover, Compiled Nothings, was self published in November of 2018. As a performance artist, she goes by the rotten fruit. Nicole, uh, excuse me, Brooke Nicole Plummer. Hello, everyone. Thanks again, Tony, for having me. The Writers Guild of Bloomington, fantastic collective to be part of, and Romy and Karen, been great. And, uh, get right to it. I'm going to read some uh, poems from my first chapbook, Fly Over Compile Nothings, and uh, maybe one or two others that are just from uh, random publications online in small places. So here we go. Midwestern Swagger. The medallion of flatlands, smoke of Turkish blend and fertilizer, elks rubbernecking graphic, bullet case things and the knots of wildflowers. Bud light caps and gold emblazoned fields convey the area code, but acres away from all the asphalt, it is quiet. A tire swing sways gently near a home that nurtured several generations, some of which developed a penchant for poetry, matured into the habit of belt lashing neurotransmitters into action, the way my great grandparents did on my tailbone when I forgot to collect scraps with scraps from the strays, or made myself purposely lost in the vineyard with a two-track mind, from treasures to textuality. Now, one track commemorates, the other accelerates its own quirks, like popping a bubble with big red of the Gutenberg Bible, igniting bottle rockets inside ramshackle sheds, or adorning properties with reed made of twigs, and the bare craniums of white airs. The sleepless counting. The moon claims losses to none of this. Cross beaming my head brushes like satellite signaled spherical. God damn the afar, misidentifying celestial bodies, still adhesive when it comes to transparent vastness. You and your ways cure me from love. Warming this. There are lessons embedded in fractures. Halo by a seeking for solace in love and hazily hoping, like incandescents hanging purple reflections on beds of snow. As the mind flutters like dozens of moths in an armoire, enabled to splatter papers with a left brain magnum without mercy, without a method for returning. This is a poem dedicated to my mother who passed in 2007. Michigan City, 1999. I brought my Capri Sun with me when I walked to the bow of a sailboat. The seagulls cawed dissonantly. I watched them, white plumaged aerodynamics. I watched them, cross-legged and serene. Mother, you feel the wind dance across your cosmetics. 
or taste the fumes of blue mass splashing, elevating us into timelessness. I remember learning Miss Susie from you and thinking the East Pierhead Lighthouse was an emporium for candy canes, a landmark of a return. Near returnal, it's no longer marked by land. It is the spirit of a poem. Penn Township Revelation. We are still young. Vertebrae, vertebrae like silly putty, it will all be used up. Pupils like tumbleweed on a stimulant, delirium with a body length. The livestock are surveying morning light. It is a sign of continuum. They graze like paper cutouts from the juvenile section. We talk like sugar cookie cookie dough by the spoonful, eggshells indiscreetly folded in. I heighten myself into calculated disembodiment, dreamily underwater. I want to be somebody's muddy diamond. All right, so I'll read some, couple of, um, publications online, The Lobby, LaSalle Avenue. I walk laps around the lobby while they wait on my prescriptions. My direction shifts when I approach cardiology or allergy. One room is cappuccino breath, small talk with tissues in hand. The other room is the anticipation of morbidity with tissues in hand. I make paces between the two, then watch the common bream make their laps with yield serenity. I want to breathe in what doesn't drown me. If I could, I would lap in the fountains of coins to collect, spend them on grapefruit by and wait with the lunatone spawns. I would laugh in the simplicities caught in solitary revitalizing. Uh, this next one I usually play as a song, um, but instead of messing with all the song quality, I'm just gonna read it as a poem. It's called Paths. I am harboring infamous stains of backfire, writing them, writing you as wholly kindled colorations as anthologies muscled by the collector of shrapnel left by betrayal. Outbursted vices induced by attention swelling for more. And why do we love harder under our own veil of invisibility? They say you're doing fine because you dream warmed over and I can only appear like a cold bursted perennial, my body cracked. Your melatonin kicks in like zoologically cheetah, like the feet trimming my daydreams. I apologize. My Computer's taking a little while to load. Jelly beans and hand grenades. A cigar, cherry tipped at the creek. Ice fog creeping around, an abdomen of bark. Echoing acoustic vibrations under autumnal skyline. Post shift luxuries, pacifying being amorphous to society, preserve me in timeless immensities. Reprisers cut spilled into the overturned trove of words arching between rural properties and unkept mattresses. I stay up too late, chewing out my mind. Xanax for grounding, the serodiferous, plum-threaded beanie 
blanketing the cranium and shoulders, strapping a backpack. Katie sketched lyricism sung restfully and dawn lifting into light pollution. Preserve me in this of all the wonders marking sacred only by the length, length of effect. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Brooke. We'll hear from uh, all our poets again in a little bit. Right now, we're going to go to Julian Douglas, who wanted to say a few words before the next set of music. Julian. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to wanted to say hi. I uh, the, the original plan was for me to perform live for you guys today. Uh, and we had some some technical challenges, um, and uh, so it made more sense for me to record. So, the three pieces that you'll hear today, or that you uh, that you hear today, uh, were done on Saturday, um, and uh, so uh, they were improvised. Um, and hopefully, I would have done something similar today had uh, had we been able to get it done technically. So, I just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, and also just say hi and introduce myself. I, um, I just moved back to Bloomington last year uh, in September. So I've been here for almost a year, but because of the pandemic, I feel like I've still only been here for a couple of months. So, um, so hi, uh, someday perhaps we'll get to meet in person and that'd be great. Um, uh, I also wanted to just talk a little bit about the, uh, about what I'm playing. So, uh, so, I'm a percussionist. These are um, percussion instruments from uh, uh, different, uh, they, they originated in uh, different cultures, different parts of the world. Uh, the approach that I am taking is, uh, is sort of derived from some of those traditions, but is also, um, uh, is also my own approach. So I've been inspired by a lot of different uh, world music traditions. Um, but, uh, but this music that you're hearing isn't, isn't traditional in any way. Uh, some of it is also sort of interesting because, um, uh, because these are ensemble instruments in, in the tradition. So they often are used in a larger context with other musicians, other percussionists or, uh, singers or whatever. So, uh, so to put something together for you that is just me, uh, was, was sort of an interesting challenge. Uh, the, the thing that you're about to hear. I start with a, a frame drum called a bendir, uh, and it's got a buzzy kind of a sound. Uh, and then I move to a West African djembe, and then I you can't see it, um, but I have a pedal board that activates a um, it activates a, a a delay effect. So if you start to hear something sort of weird that you can't where you can't see what it is that you're uh, uh, you can't see what you're hearing, that's what that is. So there's just a brief period where I'm doing that. Um, so yeah, so I think that's that's about it. Uh, I just wanted to say hi. Uh, go ahead, Kyle.
Uh, let's see, we've gone to, there we go. There I am. Well, thank you, Julie. That was fantastic. And thanks for, uh, joining us in person this evening too. And I really appreciate you, uh, putting the videos together for us. Um, you know, technology is your fiend, not always your friend. Let us now, uh, have another listen from our three poets. They will go this time in order, Karen, then Brooke, and then Hiromi. Let's start off with Karen George. Hello again. I'm going to continue with poems from A Map in One Year. The Red Urge. As dark encompasses light, a woman crosses a meadow for home, dives into longing as a bee into jasmine, her body imprinted. Cricket beats sweeten the quiet, a story of trample and joy shaped like the arc of an eye. She savors one moment of him standing at the sink, the full soak of lemon he broke open. She owns the nudge of knowing, takes as her compass the rich flick of bird across sky, hum of root drenched earth. Ambushed by beauty. Sadness, that blue blaze spilling so suddenly when you come across larkspur, light dazzled hills, the arch of a plump shell glittering, tenderness of a morning fog, the deep mountain valley. Grieving, you turn away, the breaking sharpened by the things alive. Sleep mends, the needle of night bends, stitches the fragrant water of dreams, an intricate sequence, a holy humming kiss. Feast of the missing, the unaccounted for. Clock the music of loss, the weight of holes, Borrow the scale of small birds. Map the mercy of rocky streams. Tongue the dark hungers. Stepping into night, I stride a thunderous house open to sky, walls draped with grass, Jasmine, softening maps, a sloped kitchen, a turtle nest of speckled eggs, fragrant as the sea. Your voice speaks my name, the language of color. This is the last poem I read from, from that book. Happiness distills, trees full of tongue and wind, Path with thistle and rock, cave, root of streams, light that glowed fourfold. The next two poems are from a collection of found poems that I'm doing final revisions on. Green openings. In a weedy field, trembling with crows, a woman lusts, strips, flings herself into the spectacle of being a crow. Her wings, arrows, she devours the sky. High in a leafy oak nest, she portions skewered fruit for fledglings. Same as she pieces out time between roost and the yellow house with a wingless man, where she purples flowers, assembles stones, Sometimes she forgets her body, opens herself into a golden flame, or sometimes a shaft to wound. At the ocean lip, the pleated shore, sky a marbled eye opens, 
sunk to my ankles. I struggle not to tip against the guttering rush, but I'm crumpled, snatched back by the blind sling of curl and unfurl in this blue, quick, blue green quickening. Tilted with memories, I slough what I don't want, crawl concave from the heavy, open, implacable mouth. These next two poems are from a collection of actual dreams, daydreams, and visions that I'm finishing up. Let's make a pact on remembrance. I dream of our last home together before your death. It's winter. I need to get those quilts, you say. Enter the fireplace that winds to attic rooms. Through the aperture, you pass me seven antique hand-pieced and stitched blankets, honeycomb, bear paw, crown of thorns patterns. We burrow beneath their rich, clear colors, turquoise of the sea, yellow of lemon peel, violet that mirrors your eyes and lips. Where did these come from, I ask? You can't remember, say, it was so long since I walked on that side. I kiss your lips, cold from your journey back. I wake to the taste of blueberries, your voice pleading. Let's make a pact on remembrance. This is another actual dream. Solstice dream, December. Winding through Kentucky Hill Country, I pull over, enter a store to buy Christmas stamps. They also sell tiny motorhomes I might want, but not today. The line is too long. I step outside. Last night's rain peppers the air, sluices down a hill. No, a mountain so tall, I lean back to sight its peak. An ice fog beneath a contorted bristlecone bristle pine, a snow leopard unfolds itself from sleep. Its long, thick tail rises, a warning. Knee-high flowers, a kind I've never seen, mantle the slope, voluminous aspects to the bloom, plump violet pincushion, needle-pierced, capped with orange and turquoise gemstones, layers of crinoline ruffles with feathered edges veined ink black. I wake with their viscous scent, a braid of lilac, lily of the valley, and an egg sizzling in butter. Tilt back into the dream, dizzy with longing, to find that shadow shape, its dense silver fur flecked with dark rosettes. Thank you. All right. Good to go, Tony. Yep. All right. So I should have just closed this at the beginning. Um, my poems are basically inspired by things that have happened to me in actuality. Uh, so they're seldom ever like uh, fictitious or anything like that. Um, and in my chapbook specifically, there are accounts of uh, kind of like a gruff upbringing in what is considered flyover territory. Um, so it's pretty raw and stuff like that. So I'll go into um, one poem that was published where I just took a recent trip to Cleveland and then I'll read some more from my chat book and other things that were published in um, other small presses. So this is uh, Velvet Darkness. After looking at the Hart Crane Memorial Sculpture, 
I vomited into the Cuyahoga River because I had too much cannoli at San Antonio's. Even with a broken foot, I climbed Brandywine trails to look down upon boulders the size of megalodon skulls, which are landscaping rust belt conservation areas. One of my worst fears, being too faint of heart in regards to myself. A raccoon scuttered into pink shrubbery and feel the rain without getting wet. I need the same ancient intuition, like Emersonian ink being a lifestyle of velvet darkness. So a couple from Flyover. Lover's Spit. Bell Tower reminding of the hours a tonal deepness hollowing out. Tobacco leaves looped into each other. Silver mare blurring into the meadow like a quadrupedal windmill in Fowler, Indiana. Lay me down, lay it all on me. It's brisk enough for corduroy and to ask for that familiar. Here, injurious compile steadfast texturizes like scarlet binded tongue. The tone of your name, another ticket to the South Shoreline, waving to no one. Village Green. Nicotine halved and EBT card in the back pocket weathered trailers and columns, circular punctures in the walls from nail gun fights between siblings, fly ribbon traps dangling from porch ceilings like the confetti of royalty, the opening A2 cord of take a picture in a hot boxed Buick. This is all condensing itself into a landscape verb. Tumbleweeds to the bastardized cartographies, the black-eyed socioeconomics, hollering around yellow grass with sleeve-worn propane-wrenched property line grazing patriotism, scrambling to get ahead of what it never was in the eyes of millennial greed. These next two poems were published. Um, the next two poems were published in the Wordplay Anthology, which is a collective in Elk Park. Uh, wonderful people. Uh, and this is the second anthology. This is titled Break Room. Three nights of overlapping eyeliner tethered effeminate, an axis honeyed through times of strength, barbacks liquefying damages with glassware and the life-giving callings mobilized. I wait, I wait, I, I take passion and I feel its rinds back, but it must react penetratingly. It must vocalize the momentum in blood capsules or the seeds collecting pulse from the roots. Am I imitating the, apost the apostolic palace? But why not? I can see the terminal from the third floor, pattering rain upon every inanimate thing in this percussion of water. A recurring sequence. I rubbed my palms together and felt the chalk of weathered touch. November carved another year from us, spoke to us with icicle walks. I answered with a blue football exchange in the psychiatrist's parking lot. Membrane like Cypress Hill, chakra like roomy cheeked performance afterglow 
blood serenaded into hushed observance while my nerves basked in the wheel of colors. Tempt me in the candied idiosyncrasy of the saint cloud. Tempt me into the baptizing mouth of swamp and erroneous acceptance. Tempt me into. Uh, these next two poems were published in um, this anthology called uh, The Alien Buddha Got So High. It was published on 420. Um, it's a silly, silly little thing. Um, and this one's titled The Green Market. During the Super Bowl of 2018, I sold a large batch of THC edibles to St. Mary Catholic students. They were eagerly anticipating the pink unicorn crispies that would get them higher than the GPA they had, that admitted them into the McCandless dormitories. And I was eagerly anticipating watching the last unicorn afterwards. On Tuesday night, I set up a final transaction for the remaining 73 candies and cereal bars. It was between a friend of a friend doing a solid for someone he knew, who I knew, but I didn't mention it. He appeared from his house to do the count himself, shuffling through the baggies on the hood of his Mustang Fox body with airbrushed red under eyes and nine millimeter bullets stored in the knots of his dreadlocks. Have I breached something here? Have I accidentally broken through the hive mind of Lisa Frank marketing while making the rounds during street sales? I would perk up in my dad desk if my professor asked for the proper example of irony, knowing my example would be wildly specific. Knowing my part, knowing part of my tuition is covered by someone sunken into their couch cushion, courtesy a botanical psychoactivity. What would Lady Malathea do? Be on that grind. No pending. Another click of a mechanical pencil while alternating hues trickle down onto roofs like a spillage of Christopher Wood's oil painted brain matter. Soon, I will be encephalating vocabulary crystals, pornographically daydreaming, and MLA formatting. The big ignited resin wasps will trail with me down the hallways. I will slip the word raw into the conversation and any shape from an orange translucent bottle down my throat like a bait worm lured into a watering hole. Once upon a time, I was too predictable to someone. Just wait until I come on. I'll do one more quick one from my uh, chat book. Irregularities. Cirrus stratus framing the air with a godless gray, cigarettes speckled by shower water, eyelashes stuck on wet fiberglass, the eels frank, fortune cookies and red wine for the proletariat, dilated raven's eye gravitating toward land within a 200 mile range. Tell me something profound. I spend my life waiting for it. Composing so many so what's, staring at ceiling ridges, be believing retroactively as more tough skins lap over a sinkhole. Thank you.
Okay, is it my turn now? I guess it is if Brooke said thank you. That was great. Um, okay, this time I'm going to read a series of poems that are related to Halloween. I know it's, it's a little bit early for Halloween, but since jack-o'-lanterns are already being sold at Kruger, we might as well just pre-celebrate Halloween by a, with a couple of poems about it. This one is called Jack-o'-lantern and it is going to be published in Flying Island Magazine in October. Jack-o'-lantern. Jack of all trades, of shivering, shriveling, Indiana, summer days and nights. The jagged mouth spews forth orange shadows, grins syrupy candy corn sweetness, the hollowed head, a luminous void. Moist, fibrous, pulpy rind, a house or a blackening candle stone. Flickering Cinderella, her askew ball gown petticoats, reeking soot and ash, hot molten striptease of dripping wax. The jack-o'-lantern a leering promise of plump, uncouth autumn days. Pumpkin seeds spilling into, <clears throat> excuse me, pumpkin speed. My voice is screwing up, okay. I'll just read that part again. The jack-o'-lantern a leering promise of plump, uncouth autumn days. Pumpkin seeds spilling into meat grinders of the fairy tale imagination. I hate it when my voice does that. All right, next one. This one is unpublished and it is called Juliet in the Crypt. Her roseate lips burned for oxygen in that capulet crypt, where she is so out of context among the cobwebbed skulls. Still, the folds of her gown invite mildew molecules greenly. Envious movement. Her eyelids flutter open. Pins and needles tingle through limp hands and feet. The vermilion sheath for the happy dagger opens a dusty rosebud. She yawns in dying flambeau light. Romeo twitching at her tingling feet. This one is also unpublished and it's called <clears throat> Gargoyle. Hill. Gray grimacing mouth. Vomiting rainwater, gurgling toward, toppling tombstones, mud spattered, awaiting the erosion of years. Grotesque stonework coalesced from copulation of imp, griffin, and ugly unwinged cherub. Unholy, menage a trois. The bulging eyeballs in the demon face glance toward curlicued clouds on the blunt horizon. 
luminous knife edge, cutting into the fallow land below. The gargoyle leers, chagrin of seraphim, pride of Baruch cathedral years, an obscene gloss in the luminous landscapes, intricate marginalia. Okay, I'm going to read two poems. Uh, they are both what I guess we, what I guess we could call, you know, iconically creepy, and they each contain some variation of the F word. Just for, uh, just to warn you ahead of time. This one's called Bivalve. Norman Bates and his mother are. The white heterosexual males bivolve brain parts. Symbiotic prototypes of derailed American dreams. And not only the wet or plastic variety, because every man wants to be his own mother without the hassle of donning a gray wig and a faded calico dress, of having to fuck her as though she were the blind sphinx of untimely oracles. Also, because the herboric urge to cross-dress and be that mother is normalized bait for misogyny. Hey, this one's called Release. By the time he died, Charles Manson had become known as the glorified fuck up. Incarcerated since 1971 for Helter Skelter in a jail cell that was a time capsule for his timely release. He incubated 2017 animus, halitosis and malodorous guerrilla armpits of the 1960s, festering into miasmas, waxing anachronistic phenomena to be archived electronically for voyeuristic vintage amusement like vinyl, skittering on turntables, rotating backwards, shuddering, scratchy apocalypse. Okay, so more, that is spooky, Halloweeny, but this one is based upon my own personal experience and it is called Grandma and the Devil. Pea soup projectile, the only exorcist scene Grandma mentioned during our lunch at the Megudo train station restaurant near Shirogandai, Tokyo. I could have lost it, the Okusama lunch, and developed an aversion for pea soup only. I know that grandma could have pinned the tail on the devil's cleft behind, even as she solemnly slurped her noodles. I'd wanted her to be the consoling authority figure, not merely stating the obvious, that the vomit scene was gross, kimochi na warui. I'd wanted her to exercise my 10-year-old girl terror without the diegetic death. Instead, 
She was the gray, wispy soul guardian after my parents' divorce. Her bones, a bundle of chopsticks behind finely wrinkled skin. Her shriveled, flattened out breasts beneath kimono folds. Castaway, Japanese snake skin. And so, the devil slithered away with the desiccated years, vomiting dust like an overworked vacuum cleaner hoops. Grandma became a memory folded away, like a gray moth-eaten kimono in my mind's overstuffed linen closet. All right, after having read a series of poems that are very creepy, Halloween-y, uncanny, related to the theme of horror, I'd like to cheer us up a little bit by reading something totally, well, something that tries to counteract it, but which is just as feminist. And it's called The Four Stages of Eroticism, Eve, Helen, Mary, and Sophia. So this is divided into four parts. Part one, Eve. Eve, her fig leaf, flutters away. Pubic transients and reek of sin. Garlic nymph, unblemished belly, bowl of wild wheat. Immaculate bulge of woman's flesh. Adam's ribbed condom. Castaway snakeskin slithering away, shriveled among palm trees. This thing heavy with milk and sorrow. Fading into the dapple of fallen apples, naked, long-haired mother. Apple of God's unblinking gold eye. She gags on dust, waking off the serpent's soft, delectable underbelly. Rising like bread in the ovens of misogyny. Part two, Helen. Helen, her fair beacon brow, sends off ships in hazardous directions. Helen, her feet, Unsandaled, step on scorpions in the desert of our thirst. Helen, hail dove, her mouth full of olives, her eyes plucked pearls from the Aegean Sea, her hair a shimmering net capturing minnows, geranias, grimacing oysters, spitting out grainy pearls. For the swine groveling for eye candy at her heavy embroidered hem. Helen, she is the lost civilization. Now a caryatid, carry the weight of lovely misogyny. Part three, Mary. Mary, the snake rides beneath her unshod feet, vomiting dust like an overused vacuum cleaner hooves, coughing up the debris of the BC century fattened centaurs. 
Mary. The pearl-eyed swine, gag on withered fig leaves and desiccated snake skin. The light is her kind friend. Her veils superfluous annuities. Mary, she kneels beneath the slivery new moon. God's castaway fingernail parry. The renunciation ruptured her vermilion shield, cremated her shivering bones. The burning sensation immaculately coalescing into a squeaky yes, a church mouse caught in misogyny's trapdoor. Part four, Sophia. Sophia, unscratched diamond, consummate abstraction, scrubbed window pane of the ecstatic soul, pinnacle of Jung's four stages, laureled without Apollo's muscled, raping arm. Wise serpents gather in the folds of her flowing robes, breathing circumspectly, shedding scaly skin without the weight of sin or pearly candied swine eyes or polluted ozone veils or broken chastity belts, just purity among overblown lilies. Votive candles melt at her Gnostic altar, waxing into mandala light. Okay, I will finish my second set with one final poem. The one that I like to read is called The Rabbit, which was published in Flying Island. I like reading this because, well, I like writing poems about an experience that I find disturbing and that I feel good if I were to share it with the public. And this is an example of just one of those types of poems. The rabbit. How did the rabbit cease to be just a rabbit? After all, it wasn't pulled out of some spuriously glittering magician's hat to begin with. Instead, it evolved into a furry little carcass on the sidewalk of East Atwater Avenue, across from my house. Speckled with buzzing flies in the noonday sun. It then became a sooty, viscous mess losing blood and stench in 90 degrees Fahrenheit heat. An environmental hazard for the city of Bloomington's sanitation department to clean up. By the third day since its discovery, possibly, it had melted into the sidewalk, an elongated black pancake of visceral goo. Surely I was disinclined to confirm its decomposition status despite my intensely voyeuristic curiosity. By day five or six, 
possibly. It was a dark, viscous stain, like treacle or molasses or a sticky shadow etched upon the sidewalk. In either case, a hairy, furtive thing projected from my abjection prone mind in the thick, humid evening. And perhaps because only I knew that once upon a time, it was a rabbit, a shadow that had returned permanently to the conjuring magician's glittering hat, a stinky epiphany, rabbit in paradise, R-I-P. Thank you, everybody. All right, so we're in the quick round now. So we're reading a final poem, just one. Um, and this one I just recently did for my poetry class. Um, shout out to Tony Soprano for helping me uh, write a couple of these lines here. <laughs> um, but here we go, titled The Cold is on its way. I'm sorry I've missed your calls. I was under a bridge, feeling nostalgic, but the stars reminded me that the lowest form of conversation is remember when. Leaves were applauding themselves in the fog, an abominably vermilion showcase of the fleeting. Your revelations are only second best. The heavens will call you out. I thought it was a busy night, but everyone seemed to have gone away, except everyone except for the barley harvester from Milwaukee, whose mouth had not gone dry. We spoke of what had been done too well. The absence of disorder in what we say and what we think proves a shallow grave to leave behind, a damn mute of character. He told me that his blue shed was covered with withering grapevines, then mouth missile grisly into the gravel. I noticed that his saliva was webbed with blood, but I didn't point it out. It was a sign of shadow teeth grazing around an indeterminate health. As thickly spread as we are on these frosted grounds, we are not dull, but he knows he is not needed. I know I am not needed. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Rogers Guild. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Appreciate it a lot. So I guess it's my turn again, all right. All right, I just wrote this recently and I did so in response to uh, Jason Ammerman. He said he was interested in joining us tonight, but I'm not sure if he is out there, if he could make it or not. But he inspired me to write this and it's called COVID America. It began with the Chinese virus, injected invective into mainstream media flows, no filters, till the United States of America became a filthy petri dish, breeding, incubating, resurrected hashtags and multiple truncations 
shut shutdowns, lockdowns, one-handed masturbation sessions, Walmart shopping sprees for toilet paper, and hand sanitizer. Six feet apart isn't long enough. <clears throat> Six feet apart isn't long enough distance between Democrats and Republicans. The length of an average sized coffin in America. Now, masked faces are politically correct emojis and school children and teachers are collateral damage. Waiting to be counted and collected. Slipping through the cracks of the 2020 census. Wow. Karen became the princess ensconced in ice at the glassy apex of Capitol Hill. And George Floyd became the hashtag excuse, erupting from claustrophobic suburban houses. If the coronavirus is a left-wing government hoax, the KKK is a masquerade of sadomasochistic blacks smirking in white hoods. Hold TikTok negotiations because no Americans got a Chinaman's chance. Swallow bleach to sanitize mansions of the mind inundated with misinformation. Pimp Polaroids for Facebook likes and Twitter followers. Keep digging in the gold mines of overflowing dumpsters with rubber gloves. Pick out soggy Cheerios with OCD childhood spoons because all lives matter in heaven and hell. A COVID test is like a Shirley Jackson lottery, but the black dot is the cue ball shot across vast green fields where it stripes and solids. And life and death are equal opportunities for all. America, the big boobed nation, is not particularly interested in, in flattening out curves because bigger is better and biggest is best. COVID-19 is symptomatic of the American diseases of racism and all other isms and orgasmic schisms. Corporate greed homelessness, obesity, sugar, salt, butter, cheese, red meat, fast food, barbecue sauce, overkill. Mrs. Butterworth, Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima, the menage a trois falling off their respective supermarket shelves like Confederate statues. And BLM is the graffiti scroll of underground discourse, like the N-word, the F-word, the word branded upon the obscene, obese flesh of the denying American brain. So cover up the big American motor mouth. Speak no evil. Spitting out epithelial epithets using leftover duct tape from 9-11 terror alert days. Fossey and Kevorkian morph into Siamese twins in paranoid collective consciousness. In a nation ruled by old white men. When will Uncle Sam wear a dress? When he, she, they are dressed to kill? When will we cry, Uncle? When will mother know best? When will entropic atoms coalesce into utopia? Nobody in America wants to wear a mask that covers up full, luscious, smiling lips. Cover girl is disenfranchised. Nobody wants to comply with government mandates in a democratic America. A gag bag of party tricks, a pinata exploding plastic crackerjack prizes in your face. 
America is an immigrant's wet dream. The green residue of pinched pennies. America is a melting pot of incompatible condiments, a conundrum of pundits, lamb stew of crab rangoons and national lampoons, Willy Wonka's chocolate cheer walk and Charlie Chan's chapstick factory. Enigmatic rejection of USPS operations generates nostalgia for the taste of glue on the sticky backsides of US postage stamps. America is a silly thing. America is a bleached blonde virago. America is a floating signifier. Hollywood's Mega mouth, sound, and fury. America is a masquerade of giggling, scrawny, pimpled, dimpled teenagers. America is a narcissist reflected in gilt edged, gargantuan, baroque mirrors, guilt tripping down strip malls, stripped of all shame like the naked emperor. American dads curse at barbecue grills that won't start up. American moms upbraid their pigtailed daughters for smashing their, their overstuffed piggy backs prematurely. American kids vie for the biggest unbroken cookie. American dogs sniff the biggest crotches. And it all ends with the Chinese virus eating its own gray spermatozoic rat tail, uroborically, gagging on the dust of desecrated Edens. Shriveled, mummy Chinatowns scattered across the pockmarked moon face of America, the Polaroid, cheese that stands alone. Thank you. Hello. Um, one of my obsessions is art. Um, I'm working on a collection inspired by the work and life of Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, Frida Kahlo, and Emily Carr. So my latest poem is um, inspired by Georgia O'Keeffe's painting called Zinnias, 1921. Sherbet colors, edges rounded, but for a green stem, a leaf blade, three flowers, fuzzy as if viewed through wavy glass or a glare of sun, one white, one soft pink, one raspberry, painted against pale, dreamy blue. Sex organs flecked yellow at the center. One zinnia's lower petals, silvery. An array of curved moons starting their spent descent to earth. Sweet haze of summer heat. How objects look when you fall asleep. Bleary fluid as you slip into the dream where your husband returns to life, body no longer scarred, lungs unhampered, spine perfectly aligned, lips supple plums, and you wake a sweet bitter tang on your tongue as if you'd bitten into plush, heady petals. Thank you for being such sweet listeners. Thank you, Karen. That was wonderful. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Thanks to all the poets for reading tonight. We are going to, uh, Julian uh, has another uh, pre-recorded performance is going to uh, play for us. Before we get to that, I want to give a quick shout out to 
all of our listeners and audience members at home. And uh, also want to thank all of our readers here tonight. Brooke Nicole Plummer, Hiromi Yoshida, Karen George, thank you so much for um, for doing this for us. We appreciate your uh, being here with us virtually. Let's have uh, Julian close us out, and then uh, I'll be back with a few comments after uh, after he's done.
Fantastic. Thank you, Julian Douglas, our musical guest for this evening. That is going to do it for this installment. Again, I want to thank our readers tonight, Brooke Nicole Plummer, Hiromi Yoshida, and Karen George. And again, um, once again, thanks to our musical guest, Julian Douglas, from right here in Bloomington now. <laughs> and uh, we hope to be with you in person at some point in the future. And we will, of course we will. But, uh, you know, be sure and take care of yourselves. Um, wash your hands, wear your mask and all that. Um, if you are interested in finding out more about the Writers Guild at Bloomington, uh, be sure to check out our website or uh, look us up on any of the available social media platforms out there, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we're, we're on all those things. Uh, be sure and check out the 4th Street Festival website. This weekend, we'll be debuting some uh, performance videos that we put together for our virtual spoken word stage this, uh, this year. And be sure and join us next month, uh, first Wednesday of the month, Wednesday, October 7th, for our, our next spoken word series uh, program. We'll have a couple of special guests from uh, hailing from New York. I think she's in New York now. Yeah. Eileen Miles. Is she back? Yeah, she's back in New York. Eileen Miles, poet and writer Eileen Miles, will be joining us along with Kentucky outlaw poet Ron Whitehead and his band, The Storm Generation. So that's going to be that's going to be a kicker. I'm really looking forward to uh, putting that one together and seeing how all that pans out. Um, I think that might be it for me. We'll have. Um, yes, Joan? No, nope, just clearing my throat. Oh, OK. <laughs> Uh, and thanks to uh, Kyle Quash for kind of running things behind the scenes. Um, and uh, also thanks to Joan Hawkins for co-producing the series with me. And thanks to our co-sponsors, the Indiana Arts Commission, the Bloomington Arts Commission, and the Bloomington Urban Enterprise Association. Uh, thanks to everybody. I'm going to close us out on Facebook. But if you're here on the Zoom, feel free to hang out for a moment. Thanks again, folks. Everybody. Good night. <laughs>